Hello and welcome to the Footy with Fletch podcast. This is episode 10. And today we have Richmond Tigers superstar, Matthew Richardson, also known as Richo. Hello, Richo. Thank you for joining us on the program today. It's my pleasure, Fletch. It's a really wet day outside, so it's a good day to do a podcast. It definitely is. It's a terrible day outside, but... I guess you grew up in Devonport, Tasmania. What was it like growing up in Devonport and how did that influence your football career and the person that you are today? Well, Devonport's a relatively small town when you compare it uh, to Melbourne, only 25,000 people on the northwest coast of Tasmania. And it's, it's, a, it's a nice little town on the Mersey River. Um, yeah, I guess growing up in Devonport, Pretty, pretty normal childhood in that part of the world, mate, is just playing sport, um, the normal things that kids do. Back in the 80s, there, were no, uh, there was no internet, there were no video games. So if you wanted to entertain yourself, you went outside and you kicked the football and you, and you shot the basketball, had a basketball ring on the, on the garage and played a lot of cricket in summer. So I guess my childhood was based around sport, going to school, uh, hanging out with my friends and um, my dad was also involved in one of the local football clubs, the East Devonport Football Club. So I spent a lot of time up there as a kid as well. So I guess uh, sport definitely was a part of a lot of people's uh, life and it still is today. Was there a football player that you idolised when you were growing up, Richo? Yes, uh, as far as the VFL went, it wasn't the AFL back then, it was the VFL. I was a Richmond supporter because my father had played at Richmond in the 1960s. Uh, so I guess all of my idols came from the Richmond Footy Club. Probably the biggest one was Michael Roach, who was the full forward for Richmond. Disco Roach, number eight, he was a full forward. He was also from Tasmania. So I guess the fact that he was from Tasmania and he, he was playing for Richmond, I could identify with him. Um, and I always, always played in the forward line. I was a goal kicker myself, so I really identified with Michael Roach. He uh, definitely is one of the greatest forwards of all time, uh, as you are as well. And your father gave you some advice or gave you the following nickname. His nickname for you was Autumn Lees because you were always falling to the ground. And your father then told you, you never get the ball lying on the ground. How did you react to your father's advice and how did you implement it? Well, very good, Fletch. If you've done your homework, you're 100% correct there. Yeah, Dad called me autumn leaves when I was in mini league, which was when I was in primary school. And I guess his advice was, you know, you, you should never go to ground. And if you watch the very good players play, you know, your Gary Ablitz and, and Dustin Martin and guys like this, they don't go to ground. They always keep their feet. So I guess when dad called me that early days, it was a bit of fun. He wasn't, he wasn't being too serious. But the lesson in it was that, you know, once you go to ground, you're out of the play. You know, you, you haven't got the ability to win the football. So he always said, try and keep your feet. So every time, I guess, I went near the football, uh, as I developed into my footy career, I, I guess I, I always thought of those words that dad had told me. And I always tried to keep my feet, which wasn't easy when you're a tall player because I guess tall players can tend to be a bit more clumsy than, than uh, players that are closer to the ground. So, um, yeah, it was, it was a funny nickname um, and it was something I always remembered and something I always tried to do in my footy career after that. It definitely is a great nickname. So, of course, you have a theory that AFL clubs should recruit 18-year-olds to the draft who have supported that club. Uh, why do you think that that theory is a good idea, Richo? Oh, look, it's not necessarily something that I, that I preach, but I, I, I think if you barrack for a team, when you arrive at that club, you've automatically got a passion for the club's history. You've, you've got a passion for wanting the club to succeed. So even if it's subconsciously, I reckon right from day one, 
you're invested in the place. So look, I guess if it falls that way, if all the all the all the uh, cards line up and you can you can get a player that actually barracks for the team that they're coming to, I, I think it can help. It might be it might help in a very small way, but it's better than nothing. And I think a lot of time players arrive at a club and they've barracked for someone else. Maybe they don't quite have that passion for the place. So it doesn't hurt, does it? It's a, it's an added bonus, I guess. It definitely uh, is a good theory and something that is very uh, interesting and something that I personally find is a good idea for AFL clubs to sort of, I guess, follow. But of course, uh, who would have been the three greatest Richmond players that were your teammates in your career? Uh, I guess, well, that's a tough question. I, looking back, when I first started playing at the club, um, I guess Matthew Knights was probably the best player when I arrived at Richmond. Very silky player, left footer, never went to ground, as I was talking about before, always kept his feet. Um, very good disposer of the ball. Didn't look like he was running quick, but no one ever caught him. A bit like a Marcus Bontempelli, I guess. He had that loping sort of running style. So I guess he was one. Uh, Wayne Campbell, who uh, ended up being the captain after um, Matthew Knight's, was a, a ball winner. He, he would always get 25 to, to 30 disposals every week. A great runner, very consistent, won four best and fairest, Wayne. A great leader, trained hard, led by example. He would probably be the other one. And then later on in my career, Nathan Brown, a player came from the Western Bulldogs. I guess if you're, you're looking at them talent-wise, I think he was the most talented player I played with. Unfortunately for him, he broke his leg um, halfway through, I think it was 2005, he broke his leg. He was having an unbelievable year that year. Um, he would have been All-Australian. He was, he was leading our goal kicking. He was getting 25 possessions a game. Very smart player. Um, he was probably the most talented player I played with. Matthew Knights, Wayne Campbell and Nathan Brown are all great football players. Of course, you mentioned the All-Australian and, of course, uh, you are, I believe, a part of the selection panel of the All-Australian team for 2020. How difficult was it to choose the uh, best 22 team for this year? Mate, it's difficult every year. It really is. It's a very, very hard job because there's so many players that are worthy of being all Australian. So I guess you, you, you need to go through a process and normally we have three meetings each year. And I guess when you get to the last meeting, you've got to look at the players that have been up on the board, the, the whiteboard, I guess you could say, the players that have been up there at the first, second and third meeting, because that would indicate obviously they've had a very consistent year. I think what can tend to happen in people's minds is they remember the back end of a season. They remember a player that storms home and has a great finish to a season. And, you know, they, there can be a lot of criticism of the selection panel, I guess, based on a player that came home with a, a wet sail, but maybe didn't start the year so well. So you've got to have that discipline in the selection process that you've got to go, hey, this guy was on the board for all three meetings. So clearly he's had a consistent year. So it is tough because some players might have had a quiet start to the year and have come home late. So... You've got to take all that into account. In saying that, there's probably 35 players each year that deserve to be in that 22. But unfortunately, you can't put everyone in. So there's some very unlucky players. Look, I enjoy it, um, but it is, a, it is a tough gig. It's very hard and, and, you know, there's always going to be criticism surrounding a team. I guess that uh, this also sort of leads on to when you were a player... How did you deal with the criticism from the media, the criticism from the fans? And I guess that you currently work in the media. I guess that sort of is, do you minimise your criticism of other players? Look, I, I do try and remember what it was like when I was playing because, you know, it's very hard and, and, and criticism does, it does hurt. I mean, it's very hard to not, notice the criticism. People say they don't read the papers, they don't look online, they don't listen to things, they don't look at social media, but you do. I um, mean, it's very hard to ignore it in a, in a place like Melbourne where everyone loves their football. So I guess it took me a long time in my career to finally 
block it out, I guess you could say. Block it out. And you've just got to listen to the people that matter, which is the, your coaches, your teammates, and I guess your close friends and family. Um, you've got to make sure that you're, you're keeping them happy and, ha and you're playing the way they want you to play. And you've got to, not, you've got to try not to listen to the external noise because at the end of the day, the person across the road doesn't know how your coach wants you to play. So you can't be too... I guess you can't get too worried about what they think. You've just got to worry about what your coaches think and your teammates think. It's easier said than done because football is in your face in Melbourne and, and it's everywhere. That uh, is great advice. I guess that, of course, uh, in your AFL career, in 2004 against the Western Bulldogs, you kicked 10 goals in a match. What was that game like for you on a personal level but as a team level as well? especially as you went on to win that match? Yeah, look, that's the most important thing, uh, Fletch, because you, if you have a good game and the team doesn't win, look, it isn't that satisfying because the, the best part of football is coming off the ground with your mates and singing the song and sitting around in the change rooms and just realising what you've achieved together and, and, and enjoying it. So uh, I did have a good game that day. It's the only time I kicked uh, double figures in an AFL game. And I'd be lying if I said I didn't want to. I, of course, it would have, was a dream as a kid to kick, you know, 10 goals in a game. It's sort of the benchmark, I guess. So I did enjoy it. We had a win. And uh, I had some friends over from Tasmania that weekend, actually staying in Melbourne, some good mates from school. So it was nice that they were there uh, to see me play well. And then we, you know, went out for dinner after the game and, and shared uh, a few stories. So, yeah, it was a memorable day. Yeah, it was uh, definitely an influential moment on your career. So I guess that um, you are currently the second ranked footballer at the Richmond Football Club for the most goals kicked. And what are your thoughts about that? It, it must be a great thrill to be uh, the second player at the Richmond Football Club for the most goals kicked. Yeah, I mean, when I started playing, I would never have dreamt that I would be in that position to be second on the Richmond goal-kicking tally. Oh, look, I guess it just sneaks up on you a little bit. I, I played for 17 years and I played in the forward line basically my whole career. So my job was to kick goals. So if you play for 17 years, you probably need to kick at least two goals a game. So I was able to achieve that. I guess when you finish your career and look back and, and you look at the honour board and you see your name up there alongside, um, you know, Jack Titus and... And Michael Roach and now Jack Rewalt. Um, yeah, it, it is nice to look back and see your name up on the leaderboard at the club. You definitely are one of the greatest forwards of all time in the AFL. I guess, what sort of advice do you give for up-and-coming AFL footballers who are aspiring to be a key forward? I guess, is one of the uh, key pieces of, of advice to always keep your feet? Yes, it is. That would be definitely one thing. The other, the other thing I would say is you, you, you've really got to work on your, on your aerobic fitness because as a key forward, you, you need to be on the move all of the time. Um, you know, you've got a defender on you the whole game who's trying to stop you from getting a kick. Up in the midfield, you can run around a little bit more without someone on you all day long. So my biggest advice is to be as fit as you can. You know, work on your fitness first and foremost, because that's going to give you an advantage. If you get out there and you're fitter than the guy that you're playing on, by the end of the game, I, that would probably mean that you're going to be able to get off your opponent a little bit better and probably get some easier kicks. Um, so be as fit as you can. Have a football in your hand as much as you can. As a kid, I never, I never had the footy out of my hand. You know, I'd be lying in bed at night tossing the football up in the air. So always have the footy in your hands. Even when you're sitting on the couch watching TV, you can have the footy in your hands. So... You know, touch the ball as much as you can and, you know, and train as hard as you can. Practice. If you're out there training and practicing more than anyone else, um, it's got to give you an advantage as well. And you do, have to make, you do have to make sacrifices as well. As you get older, um, you know, and other influences come into your life, you probably need to be able to have some discipline and say no to a few things. That is uh, great advice. Of course, in 2017, Richmond broke their premiership uh, drought. And uh, you were sitting on the boundary line for Channel 7 on that day. What was going through your mind when they finally won the match? 
I couldn't believe it, to be honest, Fletch. It was, it was something I never thought would happen. I reckon I'd blocked it out of my mind. It had been 37 years since Richmond had won a premiership. So um, when I finally realised that they were going to win the game, it, it was pretty emotional. Um, you know, I just, I never thought I'd see the day. So I also thought of my father who had passed away a few years previously. And I, I thought about him and how much he would have loved to have been there. Um, so with Richmond winning, breaking a drought, thinking about my father, um, yeah, my emotions got the better of me a little bit. It definitely uh, was a great day for all Richmond fans around Australia. I guess, what was the most memorable sledge that you were given during your AFL career? I can't really repeat it on this podcast stuff, Fletch. It's a, it's a PG podcast. So, look, there's always funny stuff happening out on the ground. And, you know, in the heat of the moment, I never really remembered too many of them because I was so switched on in the game. But there are many funny moments. All I will say is the best sledge I received was from a St Kilda player, Stephen Milne. Milne was a a good chatter out on the ground, I, I will say. Um, and it was nothing derogatory. It was just funny. He was a very funny man, Milne. So, yeah, he was always funny. A couple of the Geelong players were good. Matty Scarlett was pretty good at, at giving you a bit of advice. And Andrew Mackey was another one who was pretty good on the lip. Yeah, they definitely are funny moments in your career. I guess that, of course, you're an AFL commentator and you work in the media. How do you prepare for a match each week? Well, mate, you've got to watch as much football as you can. And it's, it's been easy this year because the football's been on every night and we're in lockdown. So, you know, there's not much, much else to do other than sit in front of the TV and watch the footy every night. So I've been doing that. But it's all about preparation, mate. It's like when you're playing. The more work you put into training, the better you play. So it, the football media is the same. Um, you know, the more homework you do, the more you study the games um, and, and the players, um, you know, the better you're going to be at, as a commentator. So, look, I try and watch as many games as I can. Um, you know, you make phone calls, you talk to people involved at the footy club that are coming up that week. If I'm, if I'm doing a Collingwood game, I try and speak to someone who is involved down at Collingwood just to get some, some advice and, and get some... I guess, opinion on how they're going and how some players are going. So, yeah, it, it's just doing your homework, I would say. It's like when you go to school, you do your homework. You've got to do your homework when you're a football commentator. It definitely uh, must be a great job. Of course, uh, how did you cope with the attention and, I guess, celebrity status that is associated with being an ex-footballer and a current media personality? Yeah, mate, I, I, I enjoy meeting the fans. I enjoy talking football with people. Some, some players don't. Some players, you know, want to get away from football and, and, and do other things when they're not playing. But I, but I enjoyed talking about football. So it never bothered me if I was out at a, at a restaurant or out doing something uh, socially. It didn't worry me if people come up and said g'day and talked about the football because, you know, I enjoy meeting people. I think I'm a, a people person and I enjoy the chat. So... Being uh, recognised in public was never something that worried me. Um, and, and to be honest with you, mate, we're footballers. We're just footballers. We're not, uh, we're not Hollywood uh, movie stars. So only the diehard footy fans really want to come up and say hello to you anyway. So, look, it's not, it's not a big deal. Yeah, uh, that is uh, great advice for everyone out there. What do you think about the uh, 2020 grand final being a night grand final? Uh, and do you think that it should be something that happens beyond 2020? Look, I've always been a traditionalist, Fletch. I've always said, keep it Saturday afternoon. It's always been Saturday afternoon, the last Saturday in September normally. Obviously, it's not this year. Um, the grand final would have been tomorrow, actually. So there you go. But... Um, Look, I think it's a good idea this year. It's The game's been played in a different market up in Queensland. It's an opportunity to test the waters, I guess. Look, the TV ratings will be huge with it being at night. So I suspect moving forward, if it's a success, they may keep doing it. But as a traditionalist, I just love the idea of it being Saturday afternoon, um, the last Saturday in September. So I'd probably say leave it like that. But I've got a feeling it might change moving forward. I could not agree more with you, but it will be interesting to see how uh, 
if it changes going forward. And I guess, how did you feel when you hung up your boots for one last time in your last match? What was the feeling of that? Well, I, to be honest, Fletch, I didn't know it was going to be my last game because it was, it was round five, 2009. I actually hurt my hamstring. Um, I, I snapped my hamstring tendon and I had to have surgery on it. So I was hoping to come back and play again later that year or, or the next year. But the injury didn't heal as well as I would have liked. Um, and I had to retire at the end of that season. So I never really went out there and knew that it was going to be my last game. So uh, I didn't have that feeling of running out thinking this is my last game. I, I always thought I was going to come back and play another one. I guess that this sort of leads on to my next question question what would have been your biggest regret in your AFL career just not playing a lot of finals Fletch I only played in three finals over 17 years which is disappointing you play football to play finals and you look at a Geelong footy club or a Hawthorne footy club you know players like Joel Selwood and and Tom Hawkins and Jack Gunston at Hawthorne you know they're used to playing finals every single year and that's what you play for you play football to play in finals so if I had any regret it was the fact that I didn't play in enough finals. Yeah, I guess that uh, sort of, of course, with Kate Simpson retiring last week from the Cullen Football Club, he, uh, of course, like yourself, didn't really, unfortunately, didn't have much success at the Cullen Football Club. But you and Kate were both loyal, uh, so that is great for you. Who do you think will win the 2020 Premiership, Richo, and why? Well, if I, put, if I do it with my head, not my heart, I, I just think Port Adelaide are in the box seat. They've got a home final next, uh, next weekend, next Thursday night, uh, Friday night, I think it is, sorry. Uh, and then, you know, if they win that, they've got a home prelim final. So they're in the box seat, I think, to make it through to the grand final. I think they should be favourites. And I think behind them are Richmond and Geelong. They're the next best too. Do you see Brisbane having an advantage with the uh, grand final being at the Gabba? So if they make the grand final, say, against uh, Geelong or against Richmond or against another interstate team, do you see Brisbane then going on to win the grand final? Look, if they make it, yes, it has to be an advantage. They've only, they haven't lost there all year and they only lost two games there last year. And the two games they lost there last year were finals. So clearly they have an advantage. It's their home ground. They train there. Their facilities are there. So, yeah, they've got an advantage, but they play Richmond next weekend and Richmond have actually beaten them at the Gabba. The last time Brisbane beat Richmond at the Gabba was in 2005. So Richmond have actually had a good record on that ground as well. So if Brisbane win that, though, and break that hoodoo, yes, they're a very strong chance. I could not agree more with you there. What would have been the greatest AFL match in your career aside, uh, comment that you commentated aside from the 2017 and 2019 grand final? Look, mate, I, I really enjoyed the 2016 grand final. Um, I was sitting on the boundary line commentating for Channel 7. It wasn't a high scoring game, but it was the drought breaking game for the Western Bulldogs. You know, it had been a long, long time since they had won a premiership. I think it was back in the 50s. So it was just a, a, an emotional day to see the look on the, the, all the old Bulldogs fans' faces. And I remember walking around when they were doing the lap. And I actually thought to myself that day, I thought, wow, this will, this will be what it's like if Richmond can win one. It'll be very emotional. And uh, I'll never forget that day, 2016, when the Western Bulldogs won. Yeah, that was a great day for Western Bulldogs fans around the country. What has it been like uh, being a father and what has it been like coping with a young family in lockdown? Good question, Fletch. It's been, it's been different. Uh, my daughter, Riley, has only ever known lockdown. She's been only three months old and this is what it's like. You know, this is the world she's been brought into. So it's had its challenges. It's, it's difficult uh, when you can't have family and friends over to, to see your kids. It's difficult that you you haven't been able to take them out to the park and, and to get outside and to take them and do things with them. So we've been cooped up at home, so it has its moments, but look, it's probably brought us closer together. It's probably, we've had a lot of time to, 
to bond and to share together at home. So it's been hard, but it's, it has been good in another sense. Yeah, definitely for a lot of families in Victoria, it has been difficult. I guess that how do you also balance your media commitments and uh, your commitments of being an ex-AFL footballer with your young family? Do you find it difficult to find time for your family? No, it's actually the opposite, Fletch, because I probably have more time. You know, I do work on weekends and at night. You know, I work, uh, I work Saturday night, Sunday afternoon, and I do some Thursday night games. And, and this year I've done Monday, Tuesday nights. So it's been different. Um, but you know what? I get to be around all day and I can give my, my wife a good help around the house during the day. So I probably get to spend more time with my kids. So, yeah, I've been lucky in that regard. You definitely have been lucky in that sense. I guess that when you finished up being an AFL footballer, did you always want to get into the media? Uh, no, I didn't, I didn't Fletch. It, was, it happened by accident, I guess. I was telling you before I got injured in my last year, uh, round five. And in the back of my mind, I thought, gee, you know, I'm 34 years of age. I, I'm going to struggle to get back from this injury. So I, I went and spoke to my manager. I said, mate, maybe we should just test the water and see if there's any media jobs out there. And I actually got a few a few guest uh, guest commentating roles on radio, on 3AW, and I enjoyed it. So when I actually announced my retirement, I, th I hoped that I would get jobs. And lucky enough, I got a job with Channel 7 and 3AW. So... I guess the fact I got injured in my last year sort of forced my hand a little bit, forced me to, to get out there and have a, have a look at the media. And I enjoyed it. And lucky enough, I got a job at the end of that year. You definitely have been great within the media. So thank you very much, Matthew or Richo, for your time today. You've, you are one of the greatest Richmond footballers of all time. So it's been great to talk to you. Fletch, it's my pleasure and, and well done on your podcast, mate. You've had some great guests on um, and, you know, good luck in the future. I think you've got a big future, mate. So thanks for having me on. Thank you very much. So that is episode 10 of the Footy with Fletch podcast with Richmond superstar Matthew Richardson. Thank you to everyone for listening to episode 10 of the Footy with Fletch podcast. Thank you very much to Matthew Richardson for your time. It was a great interview and it was a great opportunity to interview you. So stay tuned for episode 11 of the Footy with Fletch podcast. Bye for now.